John Byrne. Why am I covering such a, a sort of controversial, cranky writer artist? Well, it's because I'm still abroad, I am currently in Vancouver, Canada, and John Byrne emigrated to Canada at age eight. He was a Canadian, he made a Canadian comic that we're going to review today for, for its tropes, and it all just felt like it fit. So we're going to cover John Byrne. Uh, wow, what a career the guy's had. I mean, he's had some amazing, very well-respected runs on titles like X-Men and Fantastic Four. I mean, he rebooted Superman in 1986 in that Man of Steel limited series. That thing was really, really great, especially at the time. I mean, it simplified the character. It grounded him. He did a lot of great things. At one time, he was the most popular artist. The mid-80s, John Byrne was king. These days, maybe not so much, and I don't think he likes it, because he gets into these sort of bickering, uh, just cranky old man-type arguments with other comics creators like Jim Shooter, Eric Larson, Dan Slott. He's just so cranky, it seems. He once got mad at Jack Kirby. Basically, Jack Kirby was like, you know what? I don't think Marvel gave me the amount of credit and money that I'm owed. And I think that's totally fair, since he co-created half of Marvel's titles in the 60s. And at, this was like early 80s. John Byrne writes an editorial saying he's proud to be a company man and you should be pleased with what you get because you know the deal going in. It's like, who, who takes that position? Anyway, we're going to cover John Byrne. I'm going to come up with a list of his tropes, and every time we encounter one of his tropes, I'm going to try a Canadian food, a Canadian snack. Believe it or not, there are different things up here in the north compared to what we have down south. That's right, the U.S. is the south to Canada. All right, let's see which tropes there are. So put on your toque, grab a bag of milk. It's Comic Tropes Canada. Here's some of the tropes you could expect to see in a John Byrne comic book. Characters standing on the panel border, rebooting a title. Panels where everyone's mouth is agape. Dense crowd shots. Scenes involving lots of rubble. Cameos from other superheroes for just a page or two tops. Backgrounds of metal plating. Retconning characters back to life. Homages or references to older comics, especially the Lee Kirby Fantastic Four run. Evil CEOs. Cross-hatched speed lines. I wish I could come up with more, because when you see a John Byrne comic, it's a John Byrne comic. Uh, certainly as an artist. So, whatever. I still suspect we'll encounter four to five of these tropes in any given issue, but I'm going to look for something specific. We're going to go to a Canadian comic book store and try to find a Canadian superhero book that John Byrne did, Alpha Flight. Let's go. Comic Shop is a store in Vancouver that's been here since 1974. Huge selection of modern comics, back issues, some independent stuff, lots of toys, games, all sorts of awesome stuff. I'm sure I'm going to be able to find some Alpha Flight in here. That's what I'm going to look for. Let's take a look. Mission accomplished! Alpha Flight number one. Seven dollars Canadian. I don't know what the uh, exchange rate is off the top of my head. Um, I should know it. I've been using it. I don't remember it right now. Anyway, not too much, but how does that even become seven dollars? I mean, it started uh, Canadian, a dollar twenty-five when it first came out back in the, uh, back in the mid-80s. I wonder how, who determines how it appreciates like that. Who's looking for Alpha Flight number one these days? Aside from me. <laughs> All right, let's take a read. 
now that I'm looking at it, probably just by virtue of the fact that this is issue one, that's a pretty good example of him rebooting an idea. And I don't mean that he would always start it from scratch like he did with Man of Steel, Superman, uh, so much as he'd take an existing property that had been maybe neglected or wasn't as popular. Not every book that he did, but certainly a lot of them. Alpha Flight at the time were just uh, very small supporting characters from Uncanny X-Men. Uh, they were Canada's superhero team, but they'd never had their own title. John Byrne thought it would be a good idea to write and draw one. But you know what? It never really caught on. Alpha Flight just sort of hangs out on the periphery of the Marvel Universe. I'm surprised that they don't use them on something like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because there's never going to be an Alpha Flight movie, I can tell you that. But that's rebooting a title. That's a trope. I'm eating some strange Canadian delicacy. There we go. The story begins with Vindicator, the team leader, learning that, sorry, but Alpha Flight has officially been shut down. Uh, it works as part of Department H, a secret bureau of the Ministry of Defense in Canada, and the Prime Minister has told him that he's sorry, but they can't justify the spending. Alpha Flight is shut down. But we're coming across a trope right here on page three. Vindicator is standing against just this bizarre, nonsensical metal plating pattern. I, I, it's something that, like, plenty of comic book artists do. I, I, I've never really understood exactly what it's supposed to represent. I think, basically, it's giving you a textured background as compared to standing against, you know, an overly detailed hall wall or a very plain, flat, boring hall wall. But either way, that is one of the things he'd draw plenty of. That's a trope. You know what's some of the most fun reading these back issues for this series? Are just coming across the weird old ads. They just used to advertise different stuff in this way. Uh, oh, okay, this is for some sort of like a sci-fi role-playing game. And it's sort of a comic in and of itself. Wow. So Vindicator is brooding. He's in his own head thinking about how he's unemployed, unhappy. He wonders if Captain America ever has problems like this, and as he flies overhead thinking about the fact that he's an unemployed bum, uh, there's a kid in a Fantastic Four shirt pointing up at him. I think that that's a pretty good example of how, uh, no matter what he said, John Byrne loves the old 60s, 70s Marvel era. I mean, every book he has seems like it's, it's trying intentionally. Even as he gets older, it, it's almost like more powerful. Trying to throw back to those days. Uh, he does not like killing off characters. He gets mad when other characters kill off a villain. Uh, you know, he wants people to not use nicknames for superheroes. He literally once wrote a diatribe against fans calling people like Batman Bats or Spider-Man Spidey. He said it was disrespectful. These are fictional characters, John. <laughs> They're not gonna get offended because they don't really exist. But that's a cute little homage. We now cut to just some random weirdo living out in the woods. He's mad at people for not believing in him, apparently about the supernatural, because he just walks around uh, dragging his foot and he traces the image of a giant. And since this is a comic book, we can assume that he's not just drawing a picture, but rather there's supernatural forces afoot, eh? We cut to Dr. Michael Two Young Men, who's also known as the superhero Shaman. He senses something, and this is a little creepy. He pulls out a box that has his grandfather's skull in it. Uh, I guess he feels like he's feeling some sort of omen, and that by looking at the skull, he can sort of communicate with him. Creepy. We then cut to two people. Uh, one of them is just known as Mademoiselle Bobier, and she works at a school, looks like a Catholic school. And all the little girls are excited because she has a famous brother, Jean-Paul Bobier. He's a famous skier. Uh, what they haven't shown us yet, they're also both superheroes. Twins and superheroes. Also technically mutants. Uh, the interesting thing about Alpha Flight is uh, 
they are sort of like the Avengers, just they're all Canadians. Because Vindicator has a super suit, and Shaman has supernatural abilities, um, not unlike Doctor Strange, maybe. Uh, and then North Star and Aurora, that's who we're meeting here, the Barbier twins, uh, they're mutants. So her name is Jean-Marie, he's Jean-Paul. Uh, she's a little bit more uptight, he's a little bit more freewheeling, uh, he's a skiing superstar, and uh, they have an interesting discussion here, actually, where she accuses him of cheating by using his natural speed powers, and he says, wouldn't it, like, you know, why is that unfair? Like, I'm not taking any drugs or anything, it's, it's who I am. Uh, I think that we could argue, though, of course, if you have abilities that are superhuman and you're competing against people that are human, like, of course you're going to win. Um, but it isn't necessarily cheating. So, I don't know, kind of an interesting moral quandary. It isn't really resolved, but who says that they should be? It's more just an interesting idea that you can bring up with superheroes. Now we cut to the house of Heather Hudson, and it turns out she's the wife of Vindicator. Uh, these are also the people that uh, brought Wolverine in from the wilderness. They're very tied to his past before he joined the X-Men. Before they can really get into any sort of deep discussion, though, uh, James Vindicator sees on the TV news that something weird is going on, and so he has to fly out of there as Vindicator. That's weird. While Heather is uh, arguing shouldn't he call the rest of the team, he doesn't get into it, but he says there is no Alpha Flight. Technically, he's right, since they've all just been disbanded. But um, he flies off, and then these sparks are drawn. I really don't know what John Byrne is trying to say here. Uh, all right, look at this. It looks like she's just farting. Because he's coming. He's coming from over here. I mean, I guess he flew through the window, but it looks like she's just farting. What the heck is that? Oh, you know what? Okay, this is... Um, Sort of a weird example, it's also on the next page, but um, his cross-hatched speed lines. Obviously, early comics used speed lines to indicate motion. And then, sort of through the 90s into the aughts, speed lines sort of disappeared, and you just... Are, it was just sort of a, a... I don't know what you'd call it, like, just the way that the art evolved. Less and less people used speed lines. Um, but John Byrne sort of kept to an old-fashioned version of speed lines where he'd sort of cross-hatch them. He'd really use that quite a bit, and he uses it here. Uh, I'm not necessarily against it. It's just that not every artist tends to do it, especially not these days. Another trope. Heather decides that he shouldn't be going off on his own. I don't know how she evaluates the danger, but whatever. She decides that she's going to uh, use these secret cards he has that can call the rest of Alpha Flight. I guess they have some sort of implants, and there's a computerized signal sent to them. It, it, it's not fully explained here. Um, maybe it was in later issues. I really don't remember how that worked. But she's like, oh, look, uh, these two new cards have gold edges. They must be people that are ready to join the team, but aren't part of the team yet. Some interesting logical leaps that she's taking, but she puts them in and a bunch of people are called, summoned, to help Vindicator. Starting with Puck. He's got a weird convoluted origin that I'm just not going to go into now because it's really dense and weird. All that matters is that he's a little person, super strength, super athleticism. Go Puck. Then we cut to Marina. Uh, she was um, an alien, I believe, even though she had the ability to be both on land and swim underwater. She was sort of aquatic. She, I think, eventually marries Namor the Submariner. That's well after this. She gets a signal and she jumps in the ocean to go help. Finally, we've got this really genius scientist guy. His name's uh, Walter Langowski, and he can turn into Sasquatch. That's very Canadian. He just can turn into a Sasquatch. Super strong, super furry. He's kind of like a really furry Hulk. I think that's a good way of thinking about him. We meet the last member of uh, Alpha Flight, that's Snowbird. 
and her power was uh, she could fly as a human but most important she could transform into other animals initially this was other animals that were just found in the Great White North but that expanded eventually and she could turn into basically any animal but her most favorite is to be um, a snow owl and she starts as a snow owl here and transforms into a person and she's also investigating what's going on and when you know it there's just this sort of burnt corpse in the ground I guess that's the weirdo and all of a sudden the ground the earth starts gathering around him he stands up and he's just this massive creature. He calls himself Tundra. Okay, I guess when you're that big, you can call yourself whatever you want. And Jean-Marie and Jean-Paul are better known, respectively, as Aurora and North Star, and they're flying. They've got super speed and flight. They're flying to investigate in their pretty cool costumes, black and white, with a little bit of a Canadian maple leaf theme going on. Not bad. We've got another trope. Puck shows up at a nearby military base and the guy won't let him cross, so Puck just picks him up and basically dumps him in some sort of a wrestling move. But Puck is standing on the panel border. A lot of artists will tell you not to do that, that it creates weird tangents. But John Byrne does it all the time. He loves having people stand on it. It may be a product of you know, take a look at a lot of these shots that I've been showing and the ones that are coming up. A lot of them are like straight on angled shots. He does vary up like how close you are, you know, but he doesn't necessarily have a lot of, say, a snail's eye view or a bird's eye view, you know, isometric perspectives. Um, so I think when you keep having those sort of straight on shots, eventually having somebody stand on a panel border is almost, just, it's just going to happen. Fifth trope, this is a fair amount. Snowbird is the first to really uh, engage Tundra in battle, but he summons like just this massive swarm of mosquitoes. She reasons that he can control animals, I, I guess, and she decides that it's too risky for her to, to turn into one. Even though insects and animals are very different, so I don't know why she thinks that controlling one could control the other. Vindicator uses his suit to sort of uh, electrically charge the swarm to get them away from Aurora, and then he uh, goes to attack Tundra, but Tundra throws a bunch of rocks at him. Shaman flies in, and he always sort of loved hovering and flying cross-legged. Seems like kind of a weird way to fly. Vindicator blasts at Tundra, and Snowbird chastises him, telling him, that uh, Tundra is one with the land, so if he blasts him, he could blow up all of Canada with his technology. A again, I don't know where Snowbird is coming up with these conclusions. It seems like one of her superpowers is jumping to conclusions, because we don't see anything to support this. Whatever, Vindicator can't really use his powers against him. Sasquatch leaps in and starts just ripping big chunks of Tundra off of him, ch just chunks of land. That seems fairly effective, but Tundra sort of swats him away, and so much for that plan. Shaman uses his mystical powers, and finally something seems to be working. Uh, he calls down torrential rains, and they start to sort of disintegrate Tundra's body. It's not quite enough to stop him, but at least it's something that's working. And then, in the next panel, all of a sudden there's a massive water spout. It's something Marina could do. I don't know how she necessarily knew to do it because she hasn't like talked to them or anything, but I guess she saw what was going on. She caused a huge water spout from the ocean to come up and it just hits Tundra and he, he basically disintegrates. That's that. The group following the battle all return to Heather and James's apartment and they decide that even if they're not going to be funded by the government, they work well together. There's going to be an alpha flight even if there's no funding behind it. Good for them. Finally, Puck shows up, and, uh, yeah, Sasquatch just sort of makes a joke about him being short, but at least Puck starts to beat on him for that. I'd say that that's pretty well earned. All right, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, five tropes. Time to get five Canadian snacks and wrap up our international adventures with comic tropes. What's more Canadian than having a Tim Hortons donut? All right, so um, this is my first time to Tim Hortons, and I got, what else? A Canadian maple.
Oh, that's good. All right. It's got like sort of a Boston cream type of filling, but this maple glaze is really amazing. They know their maple bacon or maple maple syrup. They know their maple syrup. Mm. Oh. Definitely get it. This is a good, good donut. Maybe a great donut. I can't wait to find more. So I found a Canadian dollar store and it's the perfect place to find a ton of unique Canadian snacks. I'm gonna start them in a minute, but you gotta take a look at this treasure that I found. A transforming dolphin named Bloodthirsty. Canada, you are, you are a treasure. All right, so the first snack I'm gonna try, ketchup chips, very popular up here. I've never seen ketchup flavored chips back uh, in the States, but it's a thing here, so let's give it a shot. Very red, like fake red. Super salty, oh my goodness. It tastes sweet like a tomato. I like ketchup here and there, but this is a pretty intense flavor, actually. It's it's just, it's very, very salty. Um, it's sort of addictive. Eh. It it tastes like synthetic ketchup. It 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 has that ketchup flavor, but there's just something just just a little off about it I mean probably because it's it's artificial flavoring I, I'm assuming uh, yeah simulated flavor it says right on the bag or Sevure simule I never took French so I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right okay not bad popular snack here gave it a shot so we have orange crush back in the states but I've seen this everywhere here in Canada and I've never seen it back home um, it's cream soda or soda mousse it smells sweet I don't know why it's red that just tastes like cream maybe there's is there a strawberry to it no doesn't even say anything about strawberry anywhere on it. It's just, but it's red. I think of cream as sort of a beige color. I like this though. It's a great flavor. I mean, yeah, that's really smooth. Maybe almost a hint of vanilla or something like that. I have no idea why they don't import this down into the States. This is, this is really good soda. I have been looking for a Kinder Egg, and my Canadian buddy Randy just gave me one. Technically, this is a Kinder Surprise. Kinder is a candy from uh, Europe, and it's all over Europe, it's all over Canada. For some reason, not imported uh, in the States. The, the reason this specifically isn't is because there's a toy inside, and we have some sort of rule of you can't get you know, an inedible thing embedded in an edible thing. Let's give it a try. Let's see what it tastes like. <laughs> I can edit that. Chocolate. Hey. Favorite. <laughs> it's good chocolate. Um, it's not too waxy, but it's also not like high end or anything. It's good. Opening this up. Oh my goodness. It's a metal. It's metal. It's a metal car. That's badass. Mmm. That's fun. Those things should be in America. That's awesome. What's more Canadian than poutine? I don't know. You can't say maple syrup or Canadian beer. Poutine is definitively look at that so poutine is basically french fries with gravy and cheese curds all right get some fries and gravy and here we go 
That's hot. The cheese is chewy, kind of like a mozzarella. Mmm. I get it. I get why this is popular. This is good. This is a good snack. This is in like every restaurant, every fast food place here. All sorts of versions of poutine. I like it. All right. America, it's time to get poutine. It's good. Even I like it. And you know that I'm a picky eater. This is good. I'm kind of surprised that some of these things aren't available in America. I think that they'd be pretty popular here, um, even if I don't like everything other people would. Uh, so, Alpha Flight. Never quite took off, never was super popular. John Byrne remains very talented, especially when he has the time it takes to draw. He can also sometimes work a little fast and the details sort of uh, evaporate. But when he has time, he can still produce very good work. And I was a massive fan of his five-year run on Fantastic Four and his work with Chris Claremont. I mean, they produced some of the all-time classic X-Men stories together. Days of Future Past, Dark Phoenix Saga, these are some of the best X-Men stories. So, uh, no matter what, John Byrne has accomplished a lot in this industry. Alright, until next week, keep reading comics.